Gerald is one of my top picks for the 2023 exam question, and I'm going to give you 10 quotations. Why? Well, a grade nine essay typically needs between 13 and 15 quotes in order to get full marks. 10 puts you well on the way to that, and you chuck in a few quotes by other characters, and you'll get to 13 no bother at all. At number one is actually something Sybil Burling says when Gerald brings out the ring, the engagement ring, and presents it to Sheila. She says how clever he was to present it at just the right moment. It means that Sybil Burling knows Gerald has been having an affair. Remember, she says to Sheila, well, you'll just have to put up with it as I did. Men of business are often away for a long time. I paraphrase, but basically she's saying to Sheila, look, I know you're my daughter, but you know, you want to marry a rich guy with connections, they're going to have affairs, deal with it, just like I had to do. Now, obviously that's an appalling thing to say to your own daughter, but it's also a commentary on the patriarchal society of the time in 1912. So what does Sybil Burling mean by presenting it at the right moment? It means he's been unfaithful, Sheila's been dropping hints about last summer, and so he knows that she knows he's been having an affair. Sybil Burling knows that everybody knows Gerald has been having an affair. And now Gerald comes up with the financial transaction. Here you go, darling. Nice diamond ring. It'll all be all right, eh? Cheeky, cheeky. He doesn't talk like that at all, does he? He's not Cockney. He's from Brumley, which is like Birmingham. But never mind. He is entering into a financial transaction and he's telling Sheila, look, I'm worth mega bucks. You marry me, you'll have a title, you'll be sorted for life, life will be peachy, and I will go and have affairs and that'll be sweet, okay? This also shows that Gerald exploits women just as, as a capitalist, he exploits workers and in particular, female workers. Priestley is linking the two together. How we treat our workers and how we treat our women are the same. It defines us. It is what is wrong with society in 1912 and what could be right in 1945 when the play is performed. Priestley is aiming the play at women. Probably 70% of the audience would have been women because most of the men are still at war or they're still in the army. They haven't been demobbed yet. Women now have the vote. Women can change the future in 1945. So Gerald says to the inspector, look, we're not criminals. We're respectable citizens, you know. The inspector replies, there's not as much difference as you think. So Priestley takes Gerald. He is a respectable citizen, ladies and gentlemen, someone who comes from a really good family. Let's see how respectable he is or whether he is a criminal. Now, the true criminal in the play is Eric. He's the one who only commits an actual crime by stealing from his parents' business. But Priestley is saying, well, what if all sorts of behaviours were actually criminal? Should they be a crime? Should we take things which are really morally reprehensible and treat them as crime? And the most morally reprehensible thing that Gerald does is the way he exploits Eva or Daisy Renton as he knows her. Now, interestingly, Sheila doesn't rule out getting back together with Gerald once she returns the engagement ring. Instead, she suggests that they start over with honesty. And this is where Gerald reveals his true personality. He says to Sheila, you've been put through it and now you want to see someone else put through it. In other words, he can only think of relationships in terms of exploitation. He doesn't think about love. He doesn't think about trust. He's simply thinking about what's in it for him. And therefore he imagines that Sheila thinks the same way, but she doesn't. She wants to be loved and she wants to be trusted. And Priestley's point is that this isn't just something about these two particular characters. It's about society in general. And that is why Sheila is kind of the hero of the play. She is the one who most learns the inspector's lesson. The reason that's important in a Gerald video is because she is the antithesis, the contrast, the direct opposite to Gerald. Gerald, bad example. Sheila, good example. This is the way society should go, follow Sheila. This is the way society is going. If we don't follow Sheila, 
Gerald. Our next quotation is what Gerald says about women at the Palace Bar. He calls them hard-eyed, dough-faced women. He hates them, he says, like complete vitriol. So basically they're prostitutes and he hates them because they are now hard-faced. In other words, the experience of selling themselves to men like Gerald has ruined how attractive they are. And then he contrasts that completely to what he first sees when he meets Eva, who's there forced to make a living as a prostitute. She looked young and fresh and charming. She was pretty with large brown eyes. In other words, it's the contrast again. He's going for a youth that he can corrupt and turn into a hard-eyed, dough-faced woman. So he never stops, does he, to think about what his own actions are going to do to Eva. He's simply looking at her as someone he can exploit. How do we know that he's not just there accidentally and he's going to rescue her? Because of his passion about the women he normally meets there. So clearly, he's really used to prostitutes and he's very clearly used to paying for sex with prostitutes and then regretting it because they're not young and fresh-faced and charming. This reinforces our view that sex to Gerald is purely a financial exchange. I told the girl that if she didn't want any more of that sort of thing, she'd better let me take her out of here. These are the words that he confesses to having used with Eva. Notice the dismissive girl. He doesn't name her, the girl. She's not a woman, she's young and someone that he can exploit and also as a superior male in this society, dismiss. Look at the warning of his language. She had better let me. And the threat is, if you don't let me take you away, then people with the fat carcass like Megaty are going to have sex with you whether you like it or not because you can't afford to refuse. He's using his power over her to force her into a relationship with him and then he's going to claim, oh, it was just an accident. She treated me like a fairy prince. She fell in love with me. What can I do? It's just how I am. I didn't ask for anything in return, as though that makes it any less likely that she's going to feel she has to provide him with sex in order to keep the advantages that he's given her. She knows he is exploiting her, but she still falls in love with him because this is her survival mechanism. And from Eva's point of view, there is a chance that Gerald could potentially fall in love with her or could potentially keep her as a mistress indefinitely. Plenty of men did like that. We just have to look at Charles and Camilla. You know, marriage wasn't a way to stop having a mistress. So Eva isn't just throwing her life away here. She's actually making quite a good deal. And that deal is much easier for her to accept if she falls in love with him, because then it doesn't feel like a monetary exchange. It doesn't feel like exploitation, even though from Gerald's perspective, that's exactly what it is. The other way we find out about this is the language he uses about how he got this flat in the first place. So happened, he said, like, oh, it was like a just a random sort of event. No, it wasn't. His friend said, hey, I'm off to Canada. I'm going to give you the keys to my rooms. Get having sex with whoever you want in there. No one will know about it. You've got a room. You can put her up in there. You've got it for six months. Enjoy. And how does Gerald describe this place? He describes them as a nice little set of rooms. Yeah, not a roomy and warm flat. A nice little set of rooms. What do you do with rooms? You rent them out. What does he do with Daisy? He rents her instead of paying rent. How do we know? She's called Daisy Renton. That's what she calls herself during her relationship with Gerald. That change of name reveals how she thinks about the arrangement. She knows she's being rented. Next, Gerald exploits the inspector by pretending to be upset. He says, I'm rather more upset than I appear to be. Well, why is that? 
Well, because he can't fake the tears. He's only called her a girl, hasn't he? He can't fake a real interest in her. And so he pretends in words. He says, oh yeah, I'm really, really upset. I, does, I know it doesn't look like, oh, it doesn't look like it, I know, but I'm off and, you know, let me go. And the inspector says, fine. Well, what's his plan? His plan isn't to escape further discoveries. His plan is to go and sort out this Inspector Gould guy. Right, I went out and he goes to find a sergeant. He claims that he found a sergeant on the beat who he just happens to know. Well, first, why does he just happen to know these policemen? Well, presumably because prostitutes get arrested, don't they? He would have been a well-known figure and, you know, maybe money under the table or a bit of influence. He's not been exposed as someone who uses prostitutes. We can't prove that, that's just a Mr. Sally's supposition. However, we do know that the sergeants aren't out pounding the beat. Whereas the sergeant, they're back in the police station orchestrating who goes out where. And so when he says, I just happened to meet a sergeant, this is completely unlikely. He's gone deliberately to find a sergeant to see if he can get anything on this Inspector Ghoul guy. So now Gerald can come back and try and unravel everything by saying, well, you know everything that I confessed, none of that matters now because Inspector Ghoul's not real. How's that logic work? It works in a hypocritical society that simply values reputation and what is on the surface, which values the class system because you are socially superior, therefore you are untouchable no matter what you do. And his real message is going to be, look, our reputations are intact because nobody can expose us because the inspector isn't a real inspector. No crime has been committed. It's not gonna get into the papers. We're sweet. Whatever we did doesn't matter. And so he comes back and says, how do we know it was the same girl? So if you reread the play, you'll find there's a load of reasons that we know it's the same girl. Gerald gives a really detailed description of her. Uh, and so this girl, Daisy, notice he's calling her a girl again, uh, had exactly the same eye color, hair color, she was very pretty, she was the right age, she'd worked at Burlings, she'd worked at a shop and got the sack, there'd been a case of the flu, she'd lived in the farming community in the country somewhere before coming to the town. I mean, coincidence on coincidence on coincidence, oh, it's not the same girl. Of course it's the same girl. And what proves it is Sybil Burling's reaction. She says, and I must say, Gerald, you have argued this most cleverly and I'm most grateful. What does she mean? She means I know what you've come up with is total bullshit, but I'm really grateful because it's a really clever argument which we can use to say, no, we didn't do that to Eva Smith. We did it to all these different girls. And therefore, because it was different girls, it doesn't count. It's a ridiculous argument which Priestley uses to expose the hypocrisy of these upper class and wealthy individuals who represent, remember, the upper class and the wealth in the whole country. At the end of the play, Gerald holds up the engagement ring, offers it back to Sheila and says, everything's all right now. What about this ring? He goes straight back to the financial attraction of the marriage. Not just that it will link the two businesses of Burlings and Croft, but that it will guarantee Sheila's status. Now, really sadly, for me anyway, Sheila doesn't say, get lost. She says, not now, it's too soon, I must think. In other words, we leave the play with the very real possibility that Sheila is going to feel forced into accepting this marriage, even though she knows her husband has been unfaithful. That's where she started the play. She knew about his summertime flings. So she already knew he was unfaithful at the beginning, but was happy to accept this financial arrangement. What she couldn't accept was his lack of honesty. And that lack of honesty is still not there, is it? He's still being dishonest by claiming it didn't matter because it wasn't the same girl. And just like the beginning of the play, Sheila's mother, Sybil, is backing Gerald up. I'm really grateful that you've argued it so cleverly. What's horrible though, is that it's very likely that Sheila did end up marrying Gerald. You know, you can imagine, you kill a million young men, that's gonna leave a hell of a lot of women unmarried or desperate to accept people who they wouldn't necessarily have accepted as partners before. And so, you know, well, Sheila could do a lot worse than Gerald under those circumstances, couldn't she? And again, she can kid herself, 
that Gerald loves her and she certainly loves him. So there's an emotional investment in that which will allow her not to see it as just a financial transaction. It's a really horrible way to end the play because we feel passionately that Sheila's learned the inspector's lesson and the future can be different. But the future isn't different, is it? Because not only do we get the First World War, we get the Second World War. And that's what Priestley's saying. We didn't learn from the horrors of 1914 to 1918, just like the Burlings didn't learn from the horrors of what they did to Eva Smith. That is why the play ends with the second phone call, which is a direct reminder of the Second World War, which should never have happened, but did, because our leaders, said Priestley, marched us blindly into it. Now, here is a delightful grade nine point, which I love. Do you remember how the inspector was summoned by Burling saying, every man has to look after himself or his own. And then the inspector is summoned. He appears directly after Burling says that. What happens when Gerald says, what about this ring? Ring, 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 ring. The phone call, the second death is summoned by Gerald saying, none of this mattered, don't worry, back to normal. So he represents the patriarchal man in power. He represents the hope for the new generation, because let's face it, Eric's never gonna inherit the Burlings business, is he? But Gerald is gonna inherit Croft. So he represents what Britain could be after the First World War. And it turns out that Gerald is just like Burling, is just like the previous generation who are happy to exploit everybody, even the people they love, because they can get away with it. That is why I hate Gerald. And that is why you can get a grade nine writing about it, providing the questions about Gerald. But they nearly always are because social responsibility, hey, Gerald, an example of how we're not socially responsibility, responsible. Capitalism, hey, Gerald, that's what capitalism looks like now. Male power, you won't get asked that because the examiners are too stupid to do so. But anyway, male power, Gerald. Older versus younger generation, well, Gerald should be younger generation, but no, he does everything to side with the older generation. And therefore, that's why the end of the play is not a happy one. Sheila's lesson, Eric's lesson doesn't count because Gerald trumps them. Oh. Hating. Now, if you would like an essay on Sheila that got grade nine, it's coming up now.